We haven't talked about uh, in this uh, conference so far, none of the sessions have really gone into detail about the um, identification, uh, radio identification or RAIN RFID is, you know, uh, fairly common. Uh, there's uh, different schools of, of how to do it in um, different ways to do radio or, you know, frequency identification and uh, RFID tags in, in, uh, with, to do with underground. But I'm going to take a little bit of a, a different approach here. You're going to look at the entire technology from the chip level. And we're going to have uh, Brett Green from Impinge speaking about that. And then to the integration and productization level. And uh, also about IoT and, and multiple, uh, you know, sensor uh, systems with uh, Matt uh, Baruzzi with Omni ID. And then where the RFID hits the road is uh, from... Uh, uh, InfraWorks, which is uh, Bernson, Mike Klonzinski. Surveyors would be very familiar with Bernson as survey monuments uh, maker. You have branched off into uh, making, uh, well, how should we say cyber monuments. Uh, so before we get started, I wonder if, Ann, if you could run, there was a two minute video I thought could kind of show what the end, the end uh, product of this uh, this combined cycle would be, and then we'll get into the presentation. I am going to share my screen and uh, there's a the uh, the speakers in the panel have put like a joint presentation together of course I have to scroll down the slides a bit there we go the uh, the speakers today we're going to go in the order of, of Brett Green first then Matt then Mike but these are the panelists and uh, you uh, introduce yourselves um, whoa here we go <laughs> All right. Sorry about this. All okay. right. You got it. So, thank Brett, you. take it away and uh, tell us about Impinge. I, I really appreciate it. And thank you for inviting us to be a part of this panel today. We, we are very grateful. Um, I'm Brett Green. I'm the National IC Sales Manager at Impinge. I've been around data collection since 96 and been with Impinge since 2008. I started out as a systems guy, moved into reader sales years ago, and, and currently I'm handling our embedded sales. Impinge is solely focused on RAIN RFID, and RAIN RFID is the only technology in the world that will allow you to passively read a thousand tags a second at up to 10 meters. Impinge offers a comprehensive platform that our partners use to build turnkey solutions for their customers. That platform consists of software, like our ItemSense OS for data aggregation and product or device management. It includes connectivity like our Speedway Revolution fixed reader that's been at the top of the food chain for more than 10 years. And now the R700 that is setting the standard for performance and sensitivity in fixed readers. We have gateways like our XSPAN and X-Ray, and we have reader ICs that customers like TSL, who you hear about today, used to build handhelds and mobile devices. And at the core of our platform are endpoint ICs, like our Monza line that has been the workhorse of the industry from inception. It's also the IC that's in the tags that we'll talk about today. And now we have the 
Impinge M700 series that's going to change the landscape of how we see reader endpoint uh, ICs going forward. Impinge is a fun place to be, and I know I'm biased, but I think we are the center of RAIN RFID innovation. Gavin? Okay. So, hi, I'm, I'm Matt Baruzzi, product manager at Omni ID. Um, so, thanks, Brett. We, we use Impinge's silicon. They're you know, market leading. We've used probably in the regions of well over hundreds of millions of the endpoints, the Impinge ICs, and we haven't had a single major quality issue. So, the Impinge ICs are absolutely fantastic, and we're also very excited. Um, about the Impinge M730 and the M750 ICs, they're gonna add um, a lot of read range to the product. So you'll be able to tag things that you weren't able to do before with these new, new ICs and also the new Impinge readers that are coming out this year. So very excited about what Impinge are doing. But a little bit more about ourselves. So Omni ID, we were founded in 2007. We span out of a defense company in the United Kingdom called Kinetic. Um, and since then, we've become the world's largest supplier of passive RFID on metal tags for harsh environments. So we produce those rain endpoints for on metal harsh environments. Um, and we use Impinge's silicon. So we're the or original patent holder for the on metal passive RFID tags. We are, as I said, industry leader and over the years we have introduced many innovations to the market which includes the first global response tag back in late 2008 early 2009 so here these are tags um, which operate globally you can have them in the us or in europe and you don't need to change your readers they they work with fcc or etsy regulations or you can also have them in anywhere on, on the globe so those are truly global products they can be um, assets are in transit and you can read them with your local infrastructure um, we were the first to have the first 100 feet plus read range product so that that was this this tag here that was originally known as a dura um, that's a hundred feet read range in open air we were also the first guys to develop on metal printable labels. So these are a selection of them here. They're very thin uh, labels that can go through a thermal transfer printer. Um, work great on metal and give you good read range. And we're also the first guys to bring out very small global ceramic tags. So talking tags that are you know, this, this, this kind of size um, that operate also globally. So over the years, we've grown to be a, a multi-million dollar outfit. Um, we have our head offices now in upstate New York, based in Rochester. We have a sales presence there as well. Um, we have sales in, in Texas, and we also have regional sales offices in India, in Mumbai, sales office in Shanghai, covering the China area, and European sales is covered from our German office and also our UK office. Our R&D facility is still based in the UK, that's where I am, and we have, have our own dedicated manufacturing facility in China, um, it's a 4,500 square meter facility with about 150 odd staff who manufacture all our products for us. We do, um, see, see we've got a large QA team, we've got our, our own test lab with anechoic chambers, so we fully, fully test the products and we vet them to make sure they've got consistent RF performance. We've got a range of thermal cycling chambers where we perform highly accelerated lifetime testing. Um, the audit ingress protection, shock and vibration, and all that kind of stuff we do in-house. We have some RFID, um, some R&D functions in China as well. And um, yeah, our factory was recently rated as A by Panasonic. So we're A rated manufacturer by Panasonic. We um, do some OEM manufacture for some of their IoT visual tags. And we're also ISO 9001 certified. So in terms of you know, the build quality, the performance of our products, Omni ID is generally seen as the gold standard in, in, uh, in the market. Um, we're, we're trusted 
partner with over 300 customers ranging across 67 countries and across all six continents. And we actually have some of our tags orbiting in space 400 kilometers above our heads. And they're on the International Space Station today. So we have a very large customer base. Um, you see NASA, we're in three out of five of the top pharmaceutical companies and five out of 10 top automotive companies. And you know, we supply products to the, the world's largest social media company. So anywhere from you know, IT, where they're tracking assets in data centers, oil and gas, where people are tracking pipe, cable, spools. Um, you know, we provide that tag, which, which gives customers, allows customers to apply an ID to the asset. So once your asset has an ID, it's basically you're creating the digital twin. You're able to track it, monitor it, um, know its location, manage the inventory levels, and also review maintenance records or inspection records, if that's what you want to do. Um, so yeah, we're, we're a very agile company. A, a large percentage of our product every year that we manufacture is um, bespoke products. So we, we can customize product. We, we tailor our products for the customer's end application. Um, and yeah, we can we produce tags for every, everything, really ranging from, from golf balls. We've got a tag in the golf balls um, to aircraft carriers. So we've got tags for anything and everything, really. Um, some customers, they, they apply the tags at the source. So some very large customers will mandate that their suppliers have to apply the RFID tags or the, the rain endpoints to their assets before they're delivered to them. So it, it enables you to track and monitor your assets as they come into your facility. You know when they've come in, where they are, how many you have and, and what shelf they're on. Or other customers, they do, they do retrofit. So we have a large range of products. Uh, you can pick off off the shelf and apply it to your asset. Or again, depending on the application, we, we may need to customize it. Um, so yeah, we've got the the you know the XOs, which are super rugged, durable, fully over molded tags, um, to our fits, which are the very small ceramic tags. We have tags that that are encased, fully encased in metal. So these are sledgehammer proof. They can take a number of sledgehammer direct sledgehammer blows, um, and they they use the impinged silicon in there. We have a whole range of different attachments. You, know, you can rivet these on, you can screw them on, you can adhesively bond them. And these here, they attach with very strong magnets. So they, these are for tracking containers um, and RTIs. And um, we've got our EXO 3000, super long read range, 100 feet in the open air. But this is, this is um, what Mike uses. So when you put these on the ground, you heard earlier when the guys were talking about um, ground penetrating radar, obviously ground attenuates the signal, but when you've got a hundred feet in the open air, you know, that gives you a lot to play with. So you're, you're able to track your, your, ass, your assets on the ground. Um, so yeah, that's, that's Omni ID. Um, we also have a range of active tags. So everything I, I talked about is passive. So passive means there's no battery. So these tags have the impinged silicon they, once you, you, you apply it to your asset, you know, you're going to be able to read that tag for many decades. Um, the impinged ICs are rated for 50 years, but yeah, I'm sure they work longer than that. Um, so you can't test, you can't really test any longer than that. Um, so passive, no battery, batteryless technology, you're applying, giving an ID to your asset. Um, and as the technology evolves, we also be able to do passive batteryless sensor tags. So this is evolving market, but we do have some tags that are able to report back temperature or humidity, um, and that's completely batteryless. And on the other end of the scale, we have our active tags, which are battery powered tags. And once you, you give them the tag that battery, you're able to have a much longer communication range. So for example, on the screen, you've got LoRa up there, that's multiple miles you're able to achieve, Bluetooth, 200 meters. So much longer communication distance, but you need a battery. Battery life anywhere between five to 10 years, depending on what you're doing and what sensors you use. But once you have those batteries, then, you, then you're able to incorporate a wider range of sensors from you know, GPS, movement, light, humidity. So yeah, we've got a, a full range of IoT devices. 
um, at Omni ID. But yeah, I'll hand you over to Mike. He'll, he'll talk a little bit more about what, what he does with our tags. Um, and he's developed a very interesting application. So, uh, so Matt, this is Gavin. Um, yeah, stick around, please. i uh, got questions for both you and Brett in tying this all together. Uh, now I'm going to hand it over to Mike. The, Mike, so this is where the R, uh, for AEC, this is where the RFID hits the road. So talk about what you guys do with it. And then we're going to circle back. We've got questions in uh, for all levels of this presentation. So yeah, sure, take it yeah. away. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, I'm Mike Klonzinski. I'm the president of Bernson International. And most of the people that have been involved in surveying know Bernson. Uh, it's just about every surveyor in the country, it seems, has a Bernson hat. Uh, but uh, about 10 years ago, we started looking at what would be the next generation of marking technology. And RFID was something we looked at, and then pretty quickly, in what would how would RFID be part of a connected infrastructure? So uh, we started looking at some of the technology from Omni, from uh, Impinge, and we're putting RFID tags underground as a supplemental technology for verifying the assets. So there's a couple of key um, advantages. Uh, with RFID as a supplement to locating. Uh, one is it's uh, utility agnostic. Uh, you can go ahead and it doesn't matter if it's electric, gas, uh, above ground, below ground. You can use the same technology uh, uh, with RFID for whichever asset you're marking. Uh, a second piece is it provides that in-field verification for you. Uh, people talked about, and there's been great presentations today, by the way, about the digitizing of the underground. The problem is that the digital twin is always more handsome than the actual physical twin. And uh, when you try to go out and locate uh, a, a, an asset in the field, you need something that can go ahead and tell you or confirm that this is the spot to go ahead and actually dig. And it's actually looking for a valve, perhaps, instead of just a PVC pipe or a fiber splice instead of just a line. An RFID tag in the ground can go ahead and do that. And the third value that we saw with the RFID technology is it actually becomes the trigger to your asset management near GIS systems. So what you saw on that video, which is essentially our presentation, was a, an inspector walking across a, an infrastructure with every type of asset that would be marked with an RFID tag, uh, which you didn't see specifically, but isn't, uh, um, is there, is an underground RFID tag as well. Point and click the TSL reader, launch the ESRI inspection form associated with that asset, move on to the next, uh, the next asset. So RFID in this sense uh, has re become a, a uh, a way to validate what you're looking for underground before you have to before you have to dig. Uh, so that's the kind of system we've been operating. That's what we've been bullish about RFID as a supplement to all of the other locating technologies. And um, we think that it's really the future. As people say, it's the serial number of IoT in a lot of cases. So. Um, we're pretty bullish on the future of RFID for asset management and underground locating. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna open this up to discussion, and uh, a lot of things that we uh, when I talk to you, what we would talk about um, after the presentation, after your uh, introductions. Uh, Oh, I got a question from a user. I'm not sure. Uh, I'll read this. Uh, is there an issue with those RFIDs going missing? Well, in, if somebody digs them up, the uh, uh, there's two two opportunities. One would be uh, you can if they're uh, if they're dug up and misplaced. Uh, what we have is the Latin long that's associated with that uh, device can simply be replaced. So the RFID tag can be uh, simply attributed to that asset again, just place a new one. 
Um, but in most cases, you know, if they're underground, people aren't going to be uh, taking them, pulling them out, throwing them away. They don't even know that they're there. So we have not had that much of a problem with RFID tags being moved from it. Cool, and uh, yeah, the reason for the long introductions, because somebody asked, was uh, I, I wanted the long introductions to explain the context and how all the, all the pieces move. So it's to introduce, you know, there's talk about the RFID. There's, there's a lot of great systems out there. This is, you know, this isn't the only one and uh, they all have different merits, but I thought it'd be great to dissect how an RFID, uh, you know, the, the, the whole product cycle of it from the chip on up. And speaking of the chips, Brett, a lot of questions about the durability. You know, there, there's the, some people say, no, they don't last very long. You know, people say 50, 50 years. Um, there's not moving parts to it. I mean, what parts would deteriorate if there were any could deteriorate? Really nothing when you take, especially when you take into consideration the encapsulation that OmniID puts around the IC itself. The IC is not exposed. The outside of, of Matt's tags are either metal or ceramic or some type of tough plastic. So the spec on our IC is it's 50 years under, under most use cases, unless they're being written to every day. Okay, and uh, about the RFID, when, uh, when our publication uh, years ago started writing about RFID technology, all of the different kinds and then the frequency-based ones, that uh, people misunderstood how they work, how, how the passive could work. Could you kind of explain, it's sort of the signal that's trying to talk to it is providing what little power it needs, as I understand. Sure, the, the easiest explanation is to consider the reader a flashlight and consider the IC a mirror. And that really is at the simplest way how it works. So the flashlight or the reader is providing power or light to the IC. The IC receives that power and it has to have power from the reader to operate. It uses some of that to literally boot up and it uses the other half to backscatter or reflect its ID back to the reader. And that's how it works. Oh, okay. So, um question for Matt uh, about, you know, you built these durable enclosures and you get open air range. Actually, I think I told you yesterday that, you know, I shot one of yours through a maintenance hole lid, the iron lid. I'm just curious. I wonder if the signals are actually going through that iron lid or are they going through the, uh, the hole where you, you put in the uh, hook to, to open the lid? What, so, yeah, that, be, I mean, the signal... So if you had a massive iron plate, then yeah, you, the signal wouldn't get through. But as you mentioned, you've got holes in there. So the holes that enable some penetration of DRF and they'll be going around the sides as well. Oh, okay. A uh, question from the, uh, the attendees. Uh, could the panel give an example of RFID being read in coordination with, say, mobile mapping sensors or LIDAR? Do you know of any? Hmm. Mike, you might be the expert there. I, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with that. I'm not familiar with them using, usually it would be in, in, it might be in conjunction with, but not directly tied to. So there'll be a assistance in the locating of the asset. And then the RFID tag is read to verify what that uh, asset is and connect to the backend GIS system. Uh, but I don't know of an RFID LIDAR combination. We do a combination of RFID and magnetic technology, locating technology uh, as part of the tags that we do, but uh, hmm. not with LIDAR yet. Okay, well, maybe there's gonna be sensors on drones sweeping down a corridor when enough things have got tags on them or in them. Um, well, speaking... It's funny you say that. Um, we, what, we do actually have other customers who use our tags and um, for, for yard inventory management, and they have the readers on the drones, and they, they fly the drones around the yard, and, and they, they scan all the IDs of the tags to find the location of their assets. So that, that's, that's done. Okay, uh, we spoke yesterday, and I asked about, uh, you know, uh, tags installed on, uh, on, you know, source tagging. Uh, when you were talking about construction or BIM, uh, even, you know, utilities, heavy civil utilities installations, uh, the idea of having the tags uh, build on it when they produce the, the pipe sections or the structural members. 
Uh, do you see this trending? Uh, uh, we have, you know, customers all, all around the globe, you know, in, in Japan, we had, um, we had the meters tagged. So they had, this is going back a couple of years now, but they were tagging all the utility meters, the gas meters. So when they go out and do the readings, they scan the ID. They don't need to read the small serial number. And yeah, so some of our largest customers in the oil and gas sector where, where they're tagging all the pipes. So yeah, that's, that's a growing industry. Okay. Well, I know that in inventory management where someone could go up to a whole pallet of, of products and just shoot the whole thing at one time, there's, uh, there's, there's that going on. And uh, so Brett and, and Matt, uh, discussion about other sensors on the passive, well, on the active, of course, you could add almost any sensors because there's all the talk of IoT when it comes to managing utility systems or uh, BIM construction uh, processes than operations. So additional sensors, you know, if you had a system with a battery, you could have a battery with a micro MEMS or a temperature gauge or, you know, uh, yeah, some other movement device for structural monitoring. What could you do with a passive with that limited amount of power that it could be available? Or what have people been doing? Uh, Matt? Yeah, sure. So this is, um, I mean, this is very new for passive RFID. So you, you basically what we're doing is we're sacrificing some of the range. So the tags have got the power harvesting technology that basically, um, you know, you're generating the power from the incoming signal from that reader. So when that reader is shining its light, you're converting that to energy to energize that tag. And um, you know, if you have super sensitive tags, then you're going to be very efficient and you're going to maximize the use of that power to, to optimize your link and get a re real long range. And what some guys are doing is they're sacrificing some of that long range and using that power to power some sensors. So, so you can have, you know, not the most accurate sensors, but within a couple of degrees, you could, you could do temperature sensing within a couple, couple of degrees with passive RFID today. And okay. we do have our Monza X technology that has a nice squared C interface. So you get the standard RFID interface up front, but you also get a wired interface for, for sensor technology like that. It does require power in order to run the sensor, but that is another option. Oh. We have partners today that have sensors built on our, our Monza X technology. Okay, well, yeah, while we were talking, uh, Steve V uh, sent in a question right, right on that subject. You know, with the move to IoT for above ground assets, do you see future potential for the same when underground tags proactively reporting the state of an asset, and of course, well, power transmission always be an issue. I guess that's what you guys were talking about. Yeah. yeah. Okay. If you get into elaborate sensors, there's going to need to be a power source. I wonder if there's some way to transmit that through the ground or, you know, the uh, pipes with cathodic protection could also be providing the power for the sensors. I don't know. Blue sky. Um, yeah, people wanted uh, examples. So Mike, uh, workflow or, or how you deploy your tags. Now I understand the tags, you can only shoot so far through the ground with the readers. So if it's deep like, um, like sewer uh, and drainage, you know, that could be 20, 30 feet deep. Would you put the tag near the surface? And in which cases would you put the tag right on the underground infrastructure? Well, in most cases, you wouldn't have to. In some ways, you can think of it as a replacement for paint and flags. Uh, those aren't on the assets either. Uh, but what you can do is we typically would be in a backfill situation for any key assets that you would want to mark. So uh, conflicts, uh, valves, bends, um, any type of places that would need to be come back, need to be inspected or repaired, or for some reason you need to get back to it. Uh, typically, you would take the tags, much like uh, we already showed, something like this, which is an, uh, an Omni tag with a magnet to, uh, uh, attached to it, and put it um, somewhere between six inches below surface uh, and uh, as deep as uh, almost a meter in some cases. And, uh, and then once that's complete, um, it's also it's also lat long is uh, captured. When you wanted to go back and locate that, you use the magnetic locator to pinpoint exactly where that tag is. Read the RFID tag to um, uh, 
uh, confirm the exact asset identification and launch all the metadata that's associated with that tag and uh, then proceed to safely dig or not if it's the wrong tag, wrong information. Okay, uh, uh, kind of a compound question here. Uh, can ELM devices uh, be used to read the tags? Uh, or I'll put in parentheses, are there ELM devices with tag readers attached or could you daisy chain it? And then uh, what type of equipment cannot read the tags? I presume GPR cannot read the tags. I think you guys could answer that. Yeah, um, yeah the GPR would not read the tags. You would need them, the RFID readers are either attached or supplemental to the GPR. Uh, the GPR would be good at locating the type of asset uh, that there is. The RFID tag would be good at, the RFID reader would be great at pinpointing exactly what you're looking at, um, you know, what position uh, and what's needed. But right now, I don't know, and Brett or Matt might know, combinations of locating technology and RFID technology uh, are, are right now more band-aided together than they are actually built together. I would say so. RFID is a flavor of RF, not unlike HF and LF and, and many other technologies that are out there. It's certainly possible and doable off the shelf today. We have partners that make modules out of our R2000, as I had mentioned earlier, our uh, reader ICs, and it would not be that difficult to put together a system. I don't know of one off the top of my head that, that has some of the technologies that you've mentioned, simply because I'm not familiar with, with that industry quite as much but it's certainly doable. Okay, I, I could see the day when the surveyors data collectors have the RFID reader as a peripheral or built in uh, because it's just a chip, right? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, um, so the, the purpose for a, an RFID tag for underground utilities, this would be, uh, you know, Mike, I want to comment on this, is it's on the one hand, it's, it's like the ribbon you put, a foot, put about a foot down. The location aspect of the RFID tag, it's just kind of coarse like that. You know, you know there's a utility on there, but it's more about the identification and validation. That, is that, you know, you got the richness of being able to plug a lot of data into that tag. Yes, and especially when it's in a connected environment. As I mentioned, all of those, uh, as you may have seen in the video, all of that, that RFID tag triggers back, uh, access to all the back end information. So the tag itself, uh, we use the user memory of the tag to display who the asset owner is and the description of the asset and the lat long and a couple of other things. But uh, some of the key is that that unique RFID EPC becomes the unique asset identifier in everybody's GIS or asset management. So it's a way to go ahead and point your RFID reader at a fire hydrant, then point your ID, RFID reader underground, and then point your RFID reader at the manhole cover and launch all of the associated data uh, with just one RFID read. So that's really the power. It creates a link between the asset management and GIS systems and the locating world. Okay, you know, there, yeah, there's different schools of thought. Folks that just want an, a unique ID on the tag uh, instead of additional attribute data. And so the unique ID goes back to a database. But then again, what if that database isn't there? Uh, you know, it, you could read a lot of good stuff off the tag. Maybe it's a misconception, but some people have said, well, the more data you put on it, the more power it's going to use. And I'm like, I, I don't, uh, Brad, I don't think it works that way, right? It doesn't. It's not more, more power. It, it does require more power to write to a tag than it does read. Sure. That's getting much better today with the technology that's around. But it doesn't require more power to read it. It takes more time because that data has to come across. But time in our, in our area are, are milliseconds, not seconds. So I think you can do that. I'll tell you from experience and school, the, the, the main school of thought, when people start this, Many of them go down that road of using the tag as a database and almost all, 95 to 99%, probably closer to 99%, because of the, connectivity world, the, connect, the connected world that we live in today, end up using the tag as a license plate, as Mike had mentioned, 
and putting the majority of the data in the cloud. Okay, okay. The, the other question somebody, uh, when uh, in my day job when we were talking about it was, well, until they put RFID tags on all the utilities out there, somebody going out there, the institutional knowledge is a decade behind and somebody doesn't know, did anybody put one out there? You know, just starting to run a reader over a piece of ground and hoping that there's a tag under there. Do you think that uh, there would sort of need to be a database of the places where, where the tags had been, um, areas where the tags had been placed? Sort of, uh, yeah, when you call up your interface, you go, oh yeah, tags were placed here in this date. So you could go up and, I don't know. I'm just well, thinking out loud there. No, that's a, well, that's exactly how our system works. Uh, we can actually, in the InfraMarker software, which we didn't talk about, it's very similar to the uh, ProStar type of operation. Uh, the, the map would display all of the points where an RFID or an asset was RFID marked, as well as the dots where uh, there might just be geolocation points. So yeah, in our case, uh, we have a little InfraMarker pin that's associated with that, uh, with that point on the map. And for others that don't have an RFID tag that are just geolocated, uh, that just displays as a regular dot on the map. Oh, okay, okay. It was a comment, uh, comment to Brett, says, yep, you're right, don't bury the data with the asset. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, what about different conditions? Uh, where, where do these readers work good or not? I mean, you know, with GPR, which is completely unrelated, uh, but it is, a, you know, an electromagnetic sort of, it's, you know, clay, different soil conditions. What, what do you think about uh, reading the signals through different types of strata? Mike, you want to go first? I mean, you can go a little further than let Matt. We've had, in our experience, we've had, first of all, there's no problem reading through concrete, asphalt, um, uh, plastic, any sort of non metallic. Uh, surface, as long as it's not too uh, you know, terribly deep, we, there's a variety of tags that Omni offers and we've uh, added some things to it. Most of the uh, material between is fine. Where we get problems is uh, metal, of course, and then uh, uh, deep clay soil or heavy wet type soil uh, uh, make the RF a little bit funky and it uh, gets in, in the way of the backscatter or even of the energy reaching the chip. So uh, those are the places where we have more difficulty. What we've done is in heavy clay soils, uh, just don't bury them as deep. Don't, don't try to read from a meter, but you can move that to uh, half a meter or, or less and still be below disturbance level. Cool, and as a surveyor, I'd like to see a, an RFID on every surveyor's cap they put out there. <laughs> So, to tie back to there. Anyhow, um, oh, in the chat box, uh, Martha Mellon uh, had posted uh, posted a link to a story about drone drones uh, drones reading RFID tags to, for an inventory because that that subject came up. Well, uh, gentlemen, I I uh, I really appreciate you guys putting this panel together. Uh, it was a little un uh, unorthodox. I deliberately wanted long introductions to show how all the pieces fit together. And as I said, you know, RFID is, is out there in AEC for so many purposes, especially with IoT growing. Uh, special thanks to Matt for uh, calling in from uh, the UK. It must be very late at night there. So. Um, um, thank you. It's been um, a pleasure. Thank you for having us. Cool. So gentlemen, uh, there, if there's any questions after the last presentation, I uh, hope uh, one or more of you sticks around. So we're gonna move on to our final presentation for the day. And um, this should tie a lot of things together.